Yeah, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and more specifically, this is Looking to the East with Steve Zercher in uh, Kansai Gaidai University in Kobe, Japan, telling us about uh, things in Japan. This is an update on coronavirus in Japan. Hi, Steve. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, good morning. Yeah, nice to join you again, Jay. So what's the situation? The, the paper suggests that Japan is having a bad time of it now. Yeah, for the last few months, Japan was um, listed as an exception uh, to the rapid infection rates that most of the rest of the world has gone through dramatically in the United States and Italy and so forth. Relatively speaking, the number of infections in Japan is still low. It's in the 4,000 range, but the number of cases uh, are increasing on a daily basis. Uh, so it used to be 30 or 40 cases a day. This was a few weeks ago. Now we're into the hundreds. Actually, yesterday it was 500. Uh, it was reported in Japan. So it looks like, unfortunately, even though we're at a very low base level now, uh, Japan is beginning to climb up that steep right-hand curve, the hockey stick curve that so many countries like the United States has gone through. So it's not absolutely determined that we're actually going to go on that route, but we're certainly getting very close to it. And we're showing signs that the country could be like so many other countries and experience an overwhelming number of infections over the next couple of months. Uh, and of course, the medical resources here are going to be strained to the max. So Japan may be facing uh, some hard times over the next couple of months, much more than what we had expected was going to be the case as early as just a week or so ago. Mm. What's the government doing about it? Well, they are, uh, to their credit, reacting finally. Um, you know, it's been three months plus now going into the fourth month that uh, we all knew about this. The Japan government was very slow in initially responding. Um, there was nothing done until early March when there were some school closures. Uh, that began. But up until that point, there was no activity and the government was issuing mixed messages. Uh, then about the middle of March, the, the Diet, the Congress in Japan passed a resolution allowing the Prime Minister to declare a state of emergency, which would give the government more power in terms of issuing decrees, for example, closing schools uh, 100% or closing down any activity where there's more than 100 people or 250 people. But Abe kind of sat on that. This is a prime minister. It wasn't until last night that he made the announcement that based on the increase of infections that we just talked about, Japan is now in a national state of emergency and the government will be mobilizing in six key regions in Japan where the infection rates are the highest. This, the worst case is Tokyo. Tokyo, the, the increase there is the highest of any region. So there'll be new activities, uh, more encouragement of people to stay at home, not mandated like in some states in the United States or in some countries, but uh, there'll be more messaging from the government saying, do not go out unless it's absolutely necessary. Schools will be closed in those regions for an additional period of time and so forth. And then on the economic side, um, as you know, Japan technically is in a recession, I would imagine. We don't have the Q1 numbers yet, but I'm sure they're going to be negative. Q4 numbers were minus 7%. Q1 numbers are Ooh. easily going to be in that range, if not higher. Ooh. So Abe, just like Trump and many other national governments, is now passing a resolution to help fund businesses and uh, uh, consumers, people living at home um, with funds. So as in America, uh, people, consumers are going to receive money in Japan also somewhere between two and three thousand dollars as a subsidy will be distributed to people to help them overcome the economic downturn that we'll be facing over the next six months or so. The total amount is quite dramatic. It's a trillion dollars. So Japan's GDP is five trillion. So the subsidy that uh, Abe is wanting to pass and surely it will pass because all parties will be supportive of this is 20% of the GDP in terms of funding for businesses, for consumers, and so forth. Well, what, you know, but what, um, what's, what are the similarities and contrasts between the Japan plan and the U.S. plan? I mean, just to, just to uh, mention that the, <clears throat> the U.S. plan has issues about uh, oversight. 
It has issues, I mean, raised uh, yesterday by Mnuchin. Uh, he wants stock of the airlines in return for making uh, the loans or grants to the airlines, which the airlines mm -hmm. really don't like at all. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, in the US, uh, we have projected delays of months and months uh, before certain sectors receive a dime. Um, and furthermore, uh, there are delays at the state level uh, which block the um, which block the receipt of the money by the people it was intended for, and then they say it's not yeah. enough money. On top, and very interesting compared to the U.S., Europe has what may, many people consider a better idea. Uh, their mm. their their money their money is going to preserve jobs, not to pay people who have been fired, but to preserve the jobs so that when it's all ready to come come back again the jobs will still be there, people will still be in the jobs. So how does it work yep. in Japan? So a couple of things there, Jay. Um, one cultural factor which is in play in Japan that isn't in play in the United States is the fact that when you're hired by a major company in Japan, they're very reluctant to lay you off. So that's a kind of a cultural aspect of working in Japan. The company asks for 100% commitment from you, but then in return, uh, they're less likely to let you go as compared to the United States or Singapore or Hong Kong or other parts of the world where if the economic conditions change, you lose your job immediately. So that's a little bit of a buffer. So companies are taking a long-term view of this. And uh, frankly, if they started firing people, the those individuals could go to the, the uh, various agencies, the employment agencies, and probably get the company to pay their salary anyway. So Japanese rules and regulations are very supportive of the employee. So there's this tradition of long-term employment, which is not as strong as it was certainly 20 years ago, but it is still a factor for many companies. And then there's also regulations in Japan that make it very difficult for any company to let anybody go. And in these circumstances, because of, it, of the illness, it'd be very, very difficult for people to be let go by any companies. And then to your other point about the efficiency of the Japanese government, uh, just one anecdotal piece of information. I have a small investment. It's a Japanese, uh, it's, well, it's a brewery, a Japanese craft brewery that I've uh, invested money in. I'll, I'll probably never get that money back, Jay, between you and me. But anyway, it's a fun investment. And sometimes I get the, the founders to come to my class and talk about uh, what they're going through. But I had a chat with uh, the founder president just a couple days ago. He is already lining up loans. The, the banks are actually knocking on his door saying, how can we support you? So the government is somehow incenting banks to make loans to small businesses to save them. So it's a very different circumstances from what you're describing, which is going on in the United States in that the small businesses can't get the money. In this case, even though this is a very small business, it's barely profitable, he has multiple banks calling him saying, what can we do to help you? So there must be a tremendously strong incentive from the government to get banks to loan to small businesses. And the interest rates are zero. Wow. Uh, that's another aspect. Yeah, zero. Well, that's, that's a and cultural actually, point, isn't it? Uh, in Japan, you have this kind of feeling of community. Uh, you know, we're all in this together is something that exists already in, in the Japan culture. And I wanted to ask you about volunteers. Now, one, one thing mm -hmm. that came out in uh, the news here in Hawaii is that, um, that a lot of state employees, and there are 70,000 state employees here, 70,000, wow. that's really enormous, right? Um, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, um, a lot of them are, are not working. They're merely at home. Uh, collecting mm. their regular salaries. Uh, I, nobody knows the number, and uh, I don't think they're going to find out the number, but there are a lot of them at home just collecting salary. And and so there was a, a governmental initiative to try to get them to to volunteer, to volunteer where, where needed, since they were being paid oh. anyway. And the union, mm. HGEA, you know, the Government Employees Union said, no, no, no. If you want them to volunteer and come and help in other aspects of, you know, the crisis, you're going to have to pay them 25 mm. percent more than their ordinary salary. And I, I, I don't know if it's the union that calls for this or the members All of right. the union, but that would undermine right. any notion you might have.
for altruistic volunteering in a way. Uh, what about in Japan? Yeah. Is there altruistic volunteering? Oh, well, I, on a general level, certainly that's true. I think in the case of the Olympics, the now canceled or the delayed Olympics, they had 30,000, 40,000 people apply to vo as volunteers. There's a strong national pride, especially when it comes to a marquee event like the Olympics. Um, last uh, year, in the fall, we had the World Cup rugby competition. Uh, the numbers there, actually, I knew the person who was responsible for the volunteers. It was ten to 12,000 people volunteered. So there is a, a sense of giving back to society in Japan, volunteerism, at least for those types of events. And this event itself, um, other than the fact that you wouldn't want people to put their health at risk, I think that Japanese people would be inclined to help if they could. If, for example, they were uh, sent home and they couldn't actually do their, their normal job, or students, for example, school is closed right now uh, for many of them and they really don't have anything to do, uh, the Abe could probably call on those people and say, look, we want you to help with preparing food packages or something that's, that's non-threatening uh, to their health. And probably the response in Japan, based on my years of living here and watching Japanese people respond to these types of things, uh, would be very, very positive. And there wouldn't be any interference from uh, unions or uh, any kind of agencies. It would just be a sense that this is for the greater good. Yeah, this needs to be done as people aren't busy right now. So yes, let them go ahead and volunteer and help. So if it comes to that, um, I think the response will be very different from what you're describing in Hawaii. Yeah. <clears throat> One other thing I wanted to ask you on a, on a cultural level, you know, so you have an expansion in the number of cases and uh, I don't yeah. know, I, I assume that a number of deaths as well. Uh, one yes, follows the other. Yes, that's increasing too. <clears throat> right. But uh, so it, what, what, what is making this happen? Now we know, we have found out, although I don't think everybody understands it yet, uh, that th this virus is airborne. Um, in other words, somebody can be in a room, breathe in the room, leave the room, you come into the room, you breathe it in, now you have the virus. You didn't even know somebody was there before. And the other thing is <clears throat> that it, mm. it comes from asymptomatic people, uh, people who have yep. a very mild case. They don't even know it. Uh, they right. have no symptoms. Uh, and those people are carriers. And so you might have a, some kind of contact with them and presto, you've got it in a, in a, in a lethal dose. It only takes one viral, viral particle to infect somebody. <clears throat> so all of that considered, I wonder if uh, you have any thoughts about certain strains of gathering of being together of, of the japanese culture yeah. that that is enhancing the contagion yeah it's the infection rate now in japan is at the point where it's not traceable right so people are getting sick and they have no idea why in the early days there were clusters they could trace exactly oh this person is sick because he went to this place at this time where there was an infected now it, people are just randomly getting ill. So we're beyond the point where we can actually trace the illness. Uh, I think there's been some moderate success in terms of discouraging people from gathering at large, uh, like stadiums and so forth, baseball, all major sports are now canceled or delayed. So there's no gathering of thousands of people, which would be a normal part of the spring routine uh, whether it be football or, or baseball and so forth. And that's helped somewhat, I think, to uh, mitigate the number of infections. But the biggest challenge is at work. So the Japanese work tradition is that you're really not counted as working unless you're physically at your desk. And you're at your desk for a long time. And the people who spend more time at their desks, well, you know, eventually are the ones who get promoted. This is one of my frustrations as a businessman in Japan, that people are promoted based on time served, not necessarily on their ability. Now, that's changing around the margins, but still, that's how things are done. So, for example, at my school, I, I have a meeting, which is now going strictly remote. Uh, but last week, we actually got together, about half of us. So there were six of us in a room, and we were spaced out, and we all had masks on. And um, we completed our meeting, and then as we exited, 35 people in this office crammed into the same room. So they all are aware of the risks. They all know that it's not a good thing to do, but the fact that that's how 
work is done, that those meetings are mandatory, those meetings are totally 100% necessary, they're actually not necessary at all. You know, most meetings in Japan, like in the United States, are, are kind of a waste of time. But anyway, they all crammed in there. So that, I, that kind of behavior continues despite the warnings, despite the knowledge, despite the risk that everyone is aware of. So that's the biggest, I think, potential risk for Japan over time. Abe should say, look, everyone stay at home. You know, use the internet to do your work. Uh, don't gather in, in large groups, in meetings. But I don't think that he would have the ability uh, or would have the courage to actually make that announcement. That's the mm -hmm. challenge. <clears throat> you know, I remember the uh, trains, public transportation in Japan, although everybody's very respectful, they jam in like sardines. And you are yeah. inches away, if not less, uh, than the person next to you. Um, right. I don't think masks are very helpful, even if they're wearing masks in that circumstance. Yeah, the, that's still happening. So uh, last, last week when I was returning home, unfortunately, the, the train was late. So it was 40 minute delay. So even though the ridership is down probably 50 or 60 percent, that meant that those people were piling up, waiting 40 minutes for a train that arrives every 15. And uh, yeah, it was bad. Now, one thing about Japanese culture on trains is that people do not talk. It's very, very quiet. And uh, almost 100 percent of the people have masks, including me. I had a mask on as well. Um, so at least they're not speaking and spreading the virus out. But still, that's a high-risk area, and uh, someone could spread it in some other way uh, within a very that small space where there's a lot of people. So I've stopped going on the trains, Jay. So I hate driving in Japan, and my school is a long way away from where I live, but I've decided that no more trains for the duration. So when I do go to school, I drive. Mm. You've talked about Abe's uh, power and all that, and you know, in, in yeah. the U.S., uh, we, have, we have a very strange reverse federalism going on. You know, for the longest time, uh, power was uh, centralized in the federal government. I guess it still is. Certainly Trump is taking more power than any president has um, and, and misusing it. I, that's my opinion. Um, but then, then you have this, this uh, phenomenon where he's telling the states, no, they have to handle issues about uh, shortfalls in equipment. Uh, they have to do this, that, and the other thing. Uh, it's not, you know, mm. what did he say? Who, who are we, a stock clerk? Uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that sort of oh. uh, attitude about it. This, this is a reverse federalism. The states have to handle it. And uh, from your description, though, Steve, it sounds to me like in Japan, you don't have that. There's nobody, you know, competing for the power on this. Uh, Abe is the prime minister. If anybody's running this operation with the diet, he's the one. It's, it's, he's not relegating or delegating to individual prefectures, no? Um, the, the, the way the Japanese system works, it, there is a, a balance. So it took Abe mm -hmm. to announce that there's a national emergency to allow the prefectural leaders to take more strict actions. So they couldn't do that without the national government making it okay for them to do it. So he does have that overarching power in terms of allowing new activities, like for example, forced closure of, of businesses or demanding that uh, a company produce masks you know, or change their production to uh, produce things that are needed in order to fight the coronavirus. Um, but he can't mandate that, but now he has given permission or he has allowed uh, the prefectural level or the state level leaders to be able to carry that out. Now, one thing that they're doing too, we talked about before the, the call started, uh, at a national level, as a part of this economic stimulus pa uh, package that uh, Abe has proposed and certainly will pass very soon, um, they're funding $2 million, $2 million to get Fuji Film Holdings, which is the producer of a anti-flu drug, which may be effective against the coronavirus. It's called Avigan, A-V-I-G-A-N. So he has the power, the ability through the, con the control of the, the uh, federal budget to be able to allocate funds on a national level to support the production of, a, of a, a drug which may help to fight the coronavirus. So uh, he has power certainly in, in that regard. Well, and, and the fact that the, uh, the government uh, 
put that much money into it shows that they really care about developing a pharmacology that will that will help. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope you know. I mean, uh, how many doses did you say? Two million doses. That that yes. doesn't cover all of Japan, but it might cover a lot of no. a lot of the cases in Japan. Uh, and the question right. is, let's assume for a minute that uh, Japanese researchers are smart enough to really hit on something here. Um, mm -hmm. Query what happens to other places in the world. Uh, right. I, you know, I, I would like to see them. I would like to see them come up with something. I would like to see anybody come up with something. But how do we get it to go worldwide? This is really important because this is a pandemic. Yeah. Right. Yeah, the, he's already, Abe has indicated, the Japanese government has indicated that if this is successful, it's something that they'll share on a worldwide basis. I don't know how they would do that. If they would, uh, still with the profit motive, what would be the overarching consideration that Fujifilm would make money on this, or the government just subsidizes the distribution of the drug, not just in Japan, but maybe on a worldwide basis. Japan is certainly rich enough to do that, but I don't know what strategy they're going to take if indeed um, this uh, drug is, does have a beneficial effect. And one other thing too, Jay, I wanted to let you guys know is that the US Embassy also has been uh, very quiet uh, other than issue, issuing kind of general warnings. A couple days ago um, through the consulate, I, I received a, a video from uh, the US Embassy and it actually was quite, quite strong. Uh, surprisingly so. So basically, uh, it was recommending that all Americans leave Japan. That the infection rate is increasing and uh, there's no telling how high it will get. Uh, that for the safety of American citizens, the embassy is now strongly recommending that everyone return home. Uh, they think that if you don't go home in the, in the near term, you could be stuck in Japan for what they call an indefinite period of time. They also faulted Japan uh, for not really knowing how many people are infected in this country because they have not carried out a very rigorous testing regime. So the testing that they've done basically in Japan has only been people who they already know are sick. Uh, that's the strategy that they've used from the beginning when the coronavirus began to grow in this country. So the embassy is saying indirectly that these numbers that are reported, the 4,000 cases, could be totally underplaying the actual number of people in Japan that are infected and that for that reason they're highly recommending that Americans return home. They also said a risk factor is that uh, it may be that there, there is no way for you physically to leave Japan. So they quoted in the, in the uh, announcement that the post-pandemic flights from Japan to the United States are now at 11%. So 89% of all flights between the two countries are now canceled. So it may be at some point it'll be 100% of all flights between the two countries are canceled and there wouldn't be a way physically for you to leave Japan to get back to the United States. So that I thought was interesting that for a long time again, they didn't really say anything. They were neutral about it and just precautionary and you know wash your hands and no large groups, that kind of information, which everybody knows anyway. But a couple days ago, they decided to have a much sharper pointed message and actually place some blame on the Japanese government for not testing regular, rigorously from the beginning to try and mitigate the number of infections in this country, which is true. That is ironic. true. It's highly ironic because, because we have had terrible testing in this country. We still do. We, mm -hmm. we, we don't know who has it and we don't have a test to find out. So I find that remarkable. I find that... Uh, Highly ironic. It's the pot calling the kettle black. I don't understand yeah. why the United States would oh, say that. Certainly, certainly. Yet yeah, there were responses from the embassy saying, "Yeah, you're criticizing Japan for not testing. Who's number one in terms of infections? Who's what's the epicenter right now?" But anyway, usually they're very neutral. You know, they, they're all diplomats, right? And they generally don't criticize the government in that way. But uh, I guess they were moved to do that, maybe for the out of concern for the safety of Americans that are here in Japan and trying to emphasize, hey, look, you know, the infection rate may be way higher than what the Japanese government is reporting, which is probably the case, Jay. It's and also, probably the case you, in the U.S. also. Yes, we don't probably have the case in the U.S. Yes, I agree. We only have a couple minutes left, Stephen. I wanted to ask you one last okay. question. 
How, yes. how are things doing at uh, Kansai Gaidai University? Uh, you were going to send students home, uh, which which meant in some cases back to the U.S., uh, and you were going to yep. continue the classes in the spring uh, by by remote using Zoom. Uh, how has that worked out? Um, yeah, about 60% of our students have returned, so about 40% are still in Japan. Some schools in the United States are now mandating that their students have to return because how bad the situation has got in the United States. Um, I'd say this grand experiment with what we now call Zoom University, everybody's in, you know, it's no longer Kansai Gaidai or, or uh, University of South Florida, we're all in Zoom University now. Um, for the most part, it seems to be working. We, we did this because we wanted to preserve the credits for the students so they didn't lose a semester. Uh, but we do have some students that have disappeared. Uh, I don't know what the number is, but I'm, off the top of my head, I'd say probably 20% are not responding. Uh, either they're back home and their situation is so bad there that they're not keeping up with their classes. Or we actually have some students that are still in Japan that are not checking in with the professors, that are not responding to email and so forth. So uh, there is some loss around the edges in terms of engagement with the students. So we're, I, I don't have the hard numbers on this, but um, it's, for the most part, it seems to be working and the students seem to be happy that we're offering them this way to gain credit. But we are losing a certain percentage of students that are just withdrawing because they're overwhelmed by this or maybe you know, they discovered something else more interesting to do while they're still here in Japan than to carry out on the classes. That's a possibility. Well, it's very, very important that we catch up with you. Uh, very, very uh, good to talk to you, Steve. Uh, I, yes, I certainly you, want to follow what happens in Japan going forward. And I look forward to talking with you a couple of weeks hence and, and see how all of these, uh, all of these threads are coming out. And I know there'll be surprises one way or the other. So all I can say to you is stay well and uh, to the extent you. you can stay home and off the trains. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Jay. Good to see you. Aloha. You take care as well. You look, you look very healthy. You look like you're doing fine. I'm glad to see that. So do you, Steve. Stay that way. Thank you. Okay. Aloha. All right.